20,000 items. What he is saying is that cheap steel coming out of China is ruining our potential to not only have a great manufacturing base, but a strong national defense. It makes sense to me. And the fact that all of these disparate parties don't like it makes me even feel better about it. And, you know, Charles also saying that, uh, look, we buy over $500 billion worth of goods and services from uh, China. And so if China's going to go to war with us, then we'll say, OK, we'll buy that from somebody else. Good luck. With well, he's all the president has also tweeted, if you don't have steel, you don't have a country. And some people might say, what does that mean? It means if you don't have an industrial base that can produce your own ships and your own planes and your own, planes and your own aircraft carriers and tanks, then you're beholden to another country or another industry uh, if there is, unfortunately, a moment when you need those things. So you have to have that industrial base. Let's 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 have a stare down and see where it goes. And that's the argument he's making. All right. Let's talk about what's happened at the DOJ. Some news this morning we received. Uh, Michael Horowitz, who is the inspector general with the DOJ, he is he's uh, investigating what's going on with the FBI. If there's been any, um, you know, how they ended up spying on the Trump campaign. Yes. He's expected to release a report either this month in, in March or next month that's expected to be critical of the former deputy director of the FBI, Mr. Andrew McCabe. That's right. So it's part of a broader review of the FBI and Justice Department, how they handled the investigation into Hillary Clinton's use of a private server. Of course, Andy, when she was Secretary of State, of course, Andy McCabe oversaw that investigation, just like he's oversaw the Russia investigation. And what we're learning and what has come out, and we'll see the, the full report later on, is that Andy McCabe was behind a lot of the yeah. leaks that came out. And there's just, there's a few that were pointed to directly, one in the Wall Street Journal where he leaked, but it leads you to believe that if he leaked once, then what other times was information come out from him or others to spin a particular narrative. And let me give it just some quick context because you got all these memos and all sorts of stuff. This report from the IG, here's what we're going to see in it, okay? Just this is all you need to know. It's going to about reportedly, McCabe. Yeah. about McCabe, it's going to reportedly have uh, be critical of his actions in the final weeks of 2016 campaign. It's going to uncover information. McCabe was behind improper media leaks and the leaking of that information is sensitive details about the Clinton investigation at the end of the day, pulling the curtain further back on uh, systematic political bias at the nation's premier law enforcement so he agency. He might argue and say the four sources that say he was contributing to stories, he was giving journalists information about the investigation, Hillary Clinton's investigation. He could always say, because this is common practice, um, according to some of the articles I've read about this, mm -hmm. it is common practice within the DOJ or an FBI. If they don't, if reporters don't have the full story, then they could call up the reporter or get them information and say, look, you don't know everything, as long as they're not disseminating classified information. So the question is, what did he give reporters if he did do this? Was it classified information? Was he doing it because he was careless? Was he doing it because he wanted to add to the story and get the story straight? Or was he doing it because he's he was in the camp with Hillary Clinton or in bed with Hillary Clinton? Many people think that that could be the case, and I'll tell you why. His wife, Jill, was running for Senate in the state of Virginia. Terry McAuliffe was the governor and gave her money, funneled her money to help with her campaign. Well, Terry McAuliffe is really good friends with the Clintons. So... You've got Andrew McCabe with the FBI, who's investigating Hillary Clinton, whether or not she did classified information, mm -hmm. if she broke the laws. Meanwhile, his wife is running for Senate in Virginia. She didn't end up winning, but taking money from Hillary's friends. That's right. His name is Michael Horowitz. He's the inspector general at the Department of Justice. You don't know his name now, but when this report comes out, it could be one of the biggest. I mean, we use the word bombshell too much, but yeah. it could truly be a pulling back of the curtain and, and on this whole thing on things we didn't know about. No doubt. I'll be talking about it, reporting from Washington with you guys probably uh, yeah, you in, will in the coming weeks and days. Yeah. Now, we got to do one more story. Yes. And uh, it's a reporter that travels a lot. I really hate to pick on any airline. And I'm not going to. Especially and, the one you fly. And the one I'm going to get on tomorrow to try right. and fly back uh, to Washington. And that is Delta. That's right. Uh, now, Delta has said they're severing ties with the NRA. Delta the led the charge on the virtue signaling Alfred. of corporations after the shooting, saying, well, we won't partner with the NRA. They give some fringe benefits to NRA members. They publicly put it out on Twitter. I fly Delta all the time. I think it's a great airline, but I don't want my airline to be my moral compass. I just want you to get me from A to B. A lot of people didn't like that move. Well, legislators in Georgia really didn't like that move. They passed a law uh, that would get rid of about $40 million worth of tax breaks that Delta gets there because that's their hub. Atlanta's a huge Delta the hub. Well, the Delta CEO responded to that move in the Georgia legislature by saying this. He said, our objective in removing any implied affiliation with the NRA was to remove Delta from this debate. Our decision was not made for economic gain and our values are not for sale. We're in the process of review to end group discounts for any group 
of a politically divisive. They never should have done anything. No one even knew that they were giving discounts to the NRA members. You're an NRA member. You didn't know that they were affiliated with it. No, they I wish I did. They should have kept their mouths shut and just, you know, just not even worried about it. It only benefited. There are only 13 people, 13 NRA members that took advantage of the discount. That's I guess amazing. When you buy your ticket, you can put in the coupon code or whatever, and maybe, I don't know if that's how they yeah, were I, administering yeah, the discount. I'm guessing but that's how it is. 13 yeah. people took advantage of it, and it ended up costing them because lawmakers didn't approve their tax uh, tax cuts. It ended up costing them 30 million, 40 yeah, well, million. What it, was it? I have it written down. 40 million dollars they lost in tax. And tax don't tax forget, credit. as this plays out in Georgia, where that hub is, as you point out, Pete, you know, there's 20,000 employees for Delta. This could, if they were to uh, move their headquarters or whatnot, boy, mm -hmm. that could have a real impact. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of companies have these social responsibility departments now. Where does it start? Where does it end? And I think people, you know, you further politicize an issue when you make an affiliation or a benefit like that somehow more political. Mm -hmm. You know, let people, uh, let people decide. Email us. Let us know what you think. Have, would you fly Delta more often, less often? Friends at Fox News. You don't really have a choice. There aren't many uh, airlines. You go with one that's cheaper and that works with true. your schedule. I fly Delta all the time. Uh, me too. All right, turning now to some more headlines. We begin with extreme weather. Heavy rains, flooding, whipping winds, pounding the east coast as the nor'easter leaves a path of destruction. Look at all that rain right there. Falling trees being blamed for the deaths of at least five people across four states. The storm leaving more than one million customers without power from North Carolina up to Maine and parts of the region, including New York, seeing more than three feet of snow. The threat of winds and coastal flooding in Massachusetts will remain in effect throughout the day, so be careful. All right, a Fox News alert. An urgent manhunt ending overnight for a student accused of killing his parents at a college, Central Michigan University. Police arresting James Davis Jr., that kid right there, for he, they arrested him on a train that was running through the campus. Officers say the 19-year-old's parents were picking him up from school for spring break. He pulls out a gun, he opens fire inside his dorm room, and then he runs off. His father was a police officer, a National Guard veteran. His mother was a breast cancer survivor. There they are right there, and they leave behind two other children who are now left without their parents. The motive is still unclear. President Trump is heading to Pennsylvania to hold a campaign rally. The event now set for next Saturday was originally scheduled for last month, but it was postponed out of respect for the victims done in Parkland, Florida after that shooting. The new date follows President Trump's official announcement seeking re-election in 2020. It will mark his 20th rally in that state. They're my favorite, are and I hope there's no teleprompter. Those like, are your favorite, the rallies your Absolutely, favorite? Donald Trump on the campaign trail they with no teleprompter is... <laughs> It's fun. Must see TV. <laughs> and they oh. love them in Pennsylvania where they have a special election coming up soon. That's a good point. Pennsylvania 18, I believe. Right? Yep. I think. We'll see. All right. Remember when President Obama was touting this. I have a track record of transparency. I'll make our government open and transparent. We'll do it in a transparent way. I want transparency. I want accountability. That was a young Barack Obama. <laughs> I was. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> That's right. Well, Match Lap is here to tell us how President We'll probably see you sometime next week. We'll be signing it in, and you will have protection for the first time in a long while, and you're going to regrow your industries. That's all I'm asking you. We now have to do so. We have to act. It would be so beautiful to have one bill that everybody could support. Put it for a vote. Let's get it done. That's what we have to do. President Trump keeping things transparent in the White House. The president putting lawmakers on the record, allowing TV cameras into normally private White House meetings on gun legislation and trade. But is the swamp really ready for its close-up? Joining us now with his reaction, former deputy assistant and political director for George W. Bush, Matt Schlapp. Matt, you just morning. wrapped up CPAC. Congratulations. Yes, yes. I bet you're taking a vacation sooner. At least you deserve one. I, I thought I was going to get one, but everything <laughs> moves so fast in the age of Trump that we're back at work. It's true. We got you. <laughs> up for, it, it, it's exactly right. Right. So in the age of Trump, we also they used to call these things, I just learned this, pool sprays, which means yes. the camera went in and sprayed across <laughs> the room and then left. Now it's it sprays and stays. Um, yeah. what, what, what is that? What kind of approach is he taking with that approach? Uh, you know, this is revolutionary. And you asked whether the swamp is ready for its close up. And let me give you that answer. It is not ready. Uh, these Democrats are used to coming in, uh, doing that spray, as you say, Pete. Uh, having a, a confidential conversation, which never stays confidential, is that they yeah. leak the worst things about Donald Trump into the New York Times and into their, their other allies in the media. And Donald Trump has decided to say, okay, if, you're, if I'm going to have to hear about all these things I didn't say, why don't we let the American people hear what I'm actually saying? 
Yeah, so you say uh, part of it is that the swamp operates on the cloakrooms and the closed That's doors. Right. And then when you open it up to transparency, they're forced to either say what they really think or not say anything at all, which ultimately exposes them. Yeah, the, yes, exactly right. The other thing is it shows is that Donald Trump is active, he's engaged, he's knowledge, knowledgeable, and he's a problem solver. He wants to solve these problems. So the American people have to read all of these accounts about how Donald Trump is not actively engaged as president, and this belies that. This is the best antidote to those stupid charges. And the other thing that's great about it is, is that he separates himself with, from Congress. There's all this talk about Donald Trump's approval ratings, which are actually pretty solid. Look at his approval ratings compared to members of Congress and compared to Congress as an institution. Every time he can juxtapose himself with that, that's a winner. Hmm. Matt, he's not only transparent in these pools rates, but he's transparent all in his feelings on policy issues. We just saw it this week on guns and yep. on tariffs. Uh, this is a new thing, and it looks like lawmakers are not fully understanding what's happening there because most of them resist right away. Yeah, yeah that, no, that's exactly right, and they're... You know, as he has these conversations in these public settings, he is willing to engage uh, things that are heterodox to what conservatives and Republicans usually think. It doesn't mean he's going to actually sign something that does something contrary to our values, but he's willing to talk about it because he's a fixer. He's a problem solver. And I think the American people are very practical people. In the end, um, he's got to stay solid on the beliefs that, uh, that he cherishes, but he's got to, if you're going to work with the other side, you've got to be able to talk to them about aspects of a piece of legislation that they want as well, and that's called legislating, and that's what presidents do. They're, they're supposed to lead. Okay. Matt, thanks for coming on thanks, with Matt. us on thanks. a Saturday when you're supposed to be on vacation. Tell Mercedes we said hi. Go back to bed. <laughs> yeah, I will. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much. She's not in bed either. <laughs> <laughs> Religious beliefs sparked such backlash that he was forced to resign from the Country Music Association's, the CMA's, foundation board. Telling Fox News Channel yesterday, politics never should have been a factor. Listen. It shouldn't be about my politics, which are conservative. It should be about kids getting musical instruments. That's all this was ever about for me, that we could come together and celebrate that one part of life that civilizes us, which is the arts. And when we can't have that, then I fear that uh, our civilization may not be long for this earth. We're getting reaction from country music legend, Larry Gatlin. Larry. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, you curvy couch kids. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take it. Well, so we got to ask you this. I think if you think of country music, well, listen, I think, of, I think of a fairly conservative industry. I think of middle America, I, I, you know, all of those. Yet in this instance, if someone like Mike Huckabee is not welcome on that board, what does it say about that industry? Well, I think like much of America, we have become a more secularized. I mean, it used to be that, I mean, the Charlie Daniels of the world, the Oak Ridge Boys, the John Rich, the Gatlin Brothers, I think it has been uh, more uh, that conservatism was more the uh, philosophy. Uh, we have millennials, we have new kids, and, and that's great. They're, it's supposed to be about free speech. I mean, uh, if I may, this whole situation, see, Hannity and Gutfeld, they accuse me of being a little bit scattered. Okay, and and so far my, my Adderall hasn't had a chance to kick in, so I couldn't memorize. But if I may, this is a career move for me. Don't cut me off. It'll take 52 seconds. I, I count it. See, I don't know a lot about uh, this gory situation in Nashville. I don't know a lot about it. I do know this: it smacks of religious, political uh, uh, insensitivity, or you know, not letting Mike have his views. I know this: Mike Huckabee does not have a mean bone in his body. This is my Texas teleprompter. Uh, I know that classical liberals like John Locke and Rousseau and me, we believe in freedom of religion and freedom of speech. Uh, everybody's religious. The word comes from the Greek religios to see the world. So it's your worldview. I know the progressive liberals of today, a lot of them in the country music, the new kids, their worldview is simply that I'm responsible and Mike's responsible for their hurt feelings. Well, I ain't, and Mike ain't either. And I also, I'm supposed to be responsible for the bad decisions, every one of them they've ever made. Well, I ain't. Here's the deal. 
If you think that beer is liquid cereal, <laughs> I ain't responsible for your cirrhosis. If you think that gravy is a food group, I ain't responsible for the goo in your arteries. <laughs> Get over it. It's up to you. Uh, Mike would be a great addition to the CMA. Thank you. Now, I've written this little song y'all may like. <laughs> I pray that someday we'll all love one another. If that day ever comes, Lord, it would thrill me. In the meantime, I love everybody who don't want to kill me. So I love everybody. And Larry, does too. That's it. Larry, there is a Declaration of Independence. There is a Gettysburg Address. And we have now witnessed the Gatlin Address from Texas. Thank well you for done. putting it so clearly. Elected, well done. I will serve. <laughs> <laughs> but Larry, Larry I mean, you, you, you make us laugh about it, but you're ultimately just talking about tolerance. The definition of tolerance is working on certain issues with people who you may disagree with on other issues, and you tolerate that difference. Well, it seems to me that, like I say, the, uh, the the progressives, the new liberals, not like I say, the classical liberals, they have selective tolerance. That's right. They're tolerant of people who agree with them. And Mike Huckabee is tol He is uh, no threat to these people. Yeah. You know, uh, if it, if the situation were reversed, and Mike protested against a uh, a progressive or a liberal coming on the board because of the the liberal, the New York Times would go ballistic. They'd have a, a, a reporter down here, and it would be blasted all over. Of course, only four people in the world read the New York Times, so it wouldn't really matter. <laughs> uh, that's that's the way this simple uh, Texan feels about it. I love everybody who ain't trying to kill me, and so does Mike. That's exactly right. <laughs> and if asked to serve, you said you would. Yeah. You would serve. We appreciate oh, that. You've no, served no, no, us no. this morning. I, I, I have. I have uh, skeletons in the closet, and so far I hadn't been able to take them out and teach them how to dance. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Larry, thank you very great much. to see you this morning. Love as always. God appreciate bless. it. God bless you. Ben Shapiro taking questions on politics and love. So let's say hypothetically there's a young man here who uh, is dating a young woman who tends to lean very far left. Do you have any advice for how my car is parked illegally? <laughs> After this break, I'm going to go fix it. But we're talking about love right now. Because <laughs> Why are we, we talking about love? Well, we love Ben Shapiro, the editor of The Daily Wire. We do. But he was in my home state of Minnesota. He was supposed to, supposed to speak at the University of Minnesota. Of course, the liberals there wouldn't let him. So they push him off campus. He gives a speech in St. Paul. For safety reasons. First, it's always always about safety. Okay, right. so he goes to the speech, and usually you get political questions. Well, some a member of the audience asked a question about who he should be dating or hypothetically should be dating. Listen to the question and the answer from Ben Shapiro. So let's say hypothetically, there's a young man here who uh, is dating a young woman who tends to lean very far left. Uh, <laughs> Do you have any advice for how this young man might uh, go about exposing her to some new ideas without the relationship crashing and burning? Oh, you're an optimist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you, my friend, are making a very large mistake. <laughs> it depends what the relationship is for. Are you in it for marriage, or like you actually have to give me a, like what's the end goal here? Uh, yeah, marriage. Okay, so if you're in it for marriage, then the number one thing you must have in common with your spouse is values. You don't have interests come after values. But most people are interested in lots of things. What is important is that you have the same value system. So politics are a reflection of values. When it comes time for marriage, it is deeply important that you put values before all of the other ancillary things. If you have values in common, your marriage can outlast anything. If you don't have values in common, then the first break and the thing's over. What do what you all do think? think? Well, I think that's true. I think I'm no marriage expert, but I would say that uh, ultimately, yeah, if you don't agree on the core things with the person you're with, other things get pretty difficult. What do you right? talk about if you don't agree on this on your values? That's politics. That's religion. What the heck do you Some talk about? Do it. I mean, they do. But you're yeah. right. If you go home and you're immediately disagreeing on news of the day, that would be kind of difficult. I feel. Like. I, you have to. I, I feel like we, I have to respect my husband. In order to respect my husband, I want to. I want to look. I want him. I want him to have the same opinions. I did. <laughs> right. Thank you I was it. right, exactly. Uh, I want to think attention? the same. Yeah. 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 Not, yeah. not every couple's like that, but for me, I want to, I want to have a spouse that has Listen. the same politics, same religion as and me. Those two things are very important. I think a lot of people agree with you. In the, in the uh, entire marriage, you're never going to agree on everything. I think one thing that uh, I've learned, if anything, it is you got to be friends. At the end of the day, if you can be friends, you can disagree on these things. <laughs> hmm. Well, okay. we, we asked you okay, what you girl. thought. And you, <laughs> you got to 
Honest, be friends. Honest true. answer? Yeah. Mm, yeah. We'll see. Well, let us <laughs> keep the emails coming in. They're fun. Friends at FoxNews.com. Here's three that you've already sent in. An email from Jane said, I agree with Ben Shapiro. Opposites attract initially. Okay, there you go. But once the new exciting love normalizes, Opposites can become annoying. Yeah, when and the honey moves over, Jane, I agree. <laughs> there you go. Okay, Don says, my wife and I will celebrate 40 years of marriage. But congratulations. That's awesome. 2016 was the first time she voted Republican ever. So there is always hope. Look at that. <laughs> wow. You know, they say you start looking like each other. Yeah, right, Maybe your political right. beliefs, they probably start melding. Donald, Donald Trump clearly did that. Uh, and finally, another email. If you can have a Washington Redskins fan and a Dallas Cowboys fan under the same roof, then this should work too. As a Redskins fan, I'm not sure how that long that marriage is going to last, but good luck with that. It's more fun. It makes Sundays more fun. Yeah. It's true. You get to watch two games instead of one. You <clears throat> care about both of them. All right, 37 after the top of the hour. Keep those emails coming because we've still got an hour and 20 minutes left on the show. All right, some headlines for you. The parents of a British tourist who died in a fiery helicopter crash last month in the Grand Canyon are now suing. Jonathan Udall's parents accusing the chopper company of not installing a crash-resistant fuel system, arguing it's the reason their son died from severe burns. The 31-year-old and his newlywed were celebrating their honeymoon on that horrific day. She also died in the crash. And one Texas sheriff sending a message in response to how the Parkland, Florida school shooting was handled. Denton County Sheriff Tracy Murphy telling his deputies in a memo, quote, we do not stage and wait for SWAT. We do not take cover in a parking lot, and we do not wait for another agency. We go in and do our duty. He joined us earlier to explain. When there's children being murdered inside a school, we don't wait. You go in and you take on that shooter and you do your very best to save as many lives as you can. 17 were killed in that mass shooting down in Florida on February 14th. Well, remember this duo, the mother and daughter, proving once again they're no match for an armed robbery suspect after shooting him several times inside their liquor store in Oklahoma. Tyrone Lee now donning a net, donning a neck brace and face bandages. Look at that. In his newly released mugshot book. Letter to the DOJ, Nunez alleges the agency's surveillance warrant on a former Trump advisor clearly broke the rules on submitting evidence to the FISA court. He pointed back to the FBI's use of that fake Trump dossier to obtain the warrants, which may have violated multiple criminal statutes. Joining us now with his reaction in the man who has been at the forefront of all of this, the president of Judicial Watch, Tom Fitton. Tom, what say you? Well, I know I think it's pretty darn interesting that you have the uh, an intelligence committee chairman having to remind the FBI and Justice Department what the rules and the laws are and pretty obvious rules and laws. And the rule he was pointing to with the FBI is they got to make sure uh, that they're presenting accurate information to the FISA court that the court is expected to rely on it. And of course, they didn't make sure it was accurate. They pretended it was accurate and arguably misled the court. And on top of that, if indeed that was done, all sorts of criminal laws were violated, including conspiracy, obstruction of justice, and things like that. And uh, you got to wonder why it is this Justice Department hasn't taken action till now. Now recall, we only know about this after the Intelligence Committee fought the Justice Department and FBI for almost a year to get information about the background on the dossier. They covered up its origins. They didn't want to turn it over to Congress. And I guess it's an unfortunate, uh, it's unfortunate but not surprising uh, that they're uh, having to be told now maybe you need to do an investigation and explain yourself in terms of violations of law and your own protocols. Well, Tom, on that point, how important is it that we all see, the country, see the application for that FISA warrant? I think it's extremely important. We have these dueling memos between Nunes and, and uh, Adam Schiff. Uh, there's a debate about what the origin of the dossier was and how significant it was in terms of its use to target the Trump team. Uh, we need the underlying materials. We've sued for it in court. I know Congress wants it as well. Uh, the White House should declassify the material. It, taking a step back, the dossier is the reason for the Mueller investigation. No dossier, no Mueller investigation. And this is why I suspect the Justice Department and FBI uh, don't want to say much or do much on the dossier, which was improperly used, because it's currently being improperly used to target Mr. Trump. And if I were General mm -hmm. Sessions or I were President Trump, I'd say, hold on a second, what are we doing here? 